Heavenly Father, what an awesome honour and a privilege to be in your presence this morning, Lord God. And I just pray that I would be emptied this morning and you, Lord God, would refill me with the words you want me to share and with your heart this morning in this message. We pray, Lord God, for those that are here in person, for those that are joining us online, Heavenly Father, I pray just a complete heart and mind of surrender, ready to receive all that you have for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today, welcome if you're here gathering with us in the room and welcome to those that are joining us online. We're in this kind of hybrid mode when it comes to church, which is interesting, but it's so very good to have you with us. But here's just something I wanted to say. If there comes a Sunday where you can't join us um, or you've been joining us online and then you come back and you join us in the room, just make sure you don't get confused in terms of where you can wear your PJs, all right? Basically, PJs if you're at church at home, no PJs if you're joining us here in the room, all right? Very simple. Got that? All right, Marlene? She's nodding her head there. Ross is shaking his head. I think he wants to wear PJs. We'll look forward to seeing that, Ross. Hey, here's a question for you. Have you ever been through a moment in your life when you just felt like everything was against you, where there was no way out, where you just kind of like lost control of what was going on? And I thought about it this morning. It's almost like you're standing in front of this huge brick wall and you can't see a way over it, you can't see a way around it, you can't see a way through it. Have you ever had that kind of moment? Because that's sort of been, I think, something that... Uh, you know, I've journeyed through over the last year and people that I know that, you know, we're, we're pastoring through really tough seasons at the moment when it comes to our Grace Church family. And sometimes we can get to that situation and we can just get stuck and we can lose hope and we can lose direction and we just get this kind of like fog that comes over us and we don't know what to do next. And so as we continue our series on Stay Positive, that's really the heart. That's where this series came out of. It's about trying to help you when you come up against those obstacles in life, those challenges that come our way. Often they're unexpected, but they do come our way. And it's not things like, I've run out of milk and I'm just about to pour it on my cereal. It's not that kind of thing, as frustrating as that can be. It's not that you forget to water the plants and then a few days later you look and you go, that plant's looking a little bit unhealthy, I'm not sure it's going to make it. Now that might be disappointing if it's your favourite plant, but we're actually talking about um, things that are really those big unexpected moments that, that just knock you to the ground. You know, if I use a boxing metaphor, you know, it's like you get hit with a right hook and you get knocked to the canvas. It's those kind of things. And it could knock you around physically, it could be emotionally, it could be spiritually, it could be mentally. There's a lot of things, a lot of ways actually that these things can come up against us. And so... As we've been journeying through um, this series, uh, what I've been trying to do is sort of just share a little bit about my journey um, so that hopefully it resonates with you and maybe there's some parallels in terms of what I've gone through, what you're going through, what God's been doing in me and hopefully what he can do and has been doing in you because I'm generally speaking a very positive, faith-filled follower of Jesus. I've seen God do some mighty things in my life and people around me, but the last 12 months have been the hardest 12 months that I've had to navigate in my now 50 years of living on this earth. And I went from being someone that was positive to someone that stood in front of that brick wall and just went, I don't know what to do. i got this wall in front of me. I don't know how to get through it. I don't know how to get around it. And I was stuck. I was just looking at that. And I don't know if you've had that experience, but it's a really, it's a really tough place to be because you just don't know what to do. The good thing for me, and hopefully for you, is that God's, you know, taken me through the journey. You know, I feel like I'm at the other side. You know, I've got my way over the wall. I'm on the other side of it, and I'm able to share that with you this morning. But, you know, for me, it was like my faith and my optimism had just been erased, like the the faith hard drive had been erased, and there was nothing there um, at all anymore. And at some moments, it was a really dark and unhealthy place for me to be. It just was. And, um, you know, I, I had some, some thoughts that 
were just really troubling. They, they were. They were really troubling. But um, the thing is, I got through it. And the thing is that you too can get through it when you're going through some tough stuff. And you can't get through it alone. But when you allow, and I use that word deliberately, when you allow God into the journey, and we sung a song this morning about being surrendered, when we surrender to him and what he wants to do, the great thing is that we get to the other side of the wall and sometimes, most times, we actually don't know how we did it because we didn't do it. God actually got us to that other side of the wall. But we went on a journey And then before you know it, you're kind of looking back and you're going, hold on, the wall's not in front of me, now the wall's behind me. How did that happen? It happened because God did it. But we have to have that posture of surrender. We have to get to that place where we allow him to do what he needs to do. And that's not comfortable and sometimes the stuff that we have to go through isn't very comfortable at all. But We need to fight for faith. Faith is a fight. We are in a spiritual battle. Let's not forget that. And so we have to uh, remind ourselves about that. So over the last few weeks, we've been building a foundation in terms of this series. And we've got one verse that, that has helped us to lay that foundation. And it comes from Romans 8.28. Here's what it says. We are confident that God is able to orchestrate everything, say everything to your neighbor, to work towards something good, say good, and beautiful, say beautiful. All right, how about you say it like you believe it now? And beautiful. When we love him and accept his invitation or we allow him to live according to his plan. Romans 8.28, that is our foundation verse. It's what we've been talking about through the course of this series. God is always good and everything that we go through, he uses it for his plan and his purpose to bring about things that are good and beautiful. Can we say amen to that? Even if we don't believe it this morning, can we say amen to that? Because he is bringing about good and beautiful things. And there's been a key thought that I've wanted you to have right through this series. And the key thought is this. If it's not good yet... It just means God isn't done yet. If it's not good, it just means God hasn't finished working yet. He hasn't finished doing what he wants to do. And so today I want to spend some time in a passage that you probably know very, very well. It's Ezekiel 37. And my message this morning is called The Bones Are Rattling. Now, this is nothing to do, just so that you're aware, it's nothing to do with the fact that I turned 50 this year and I'm getting older. And yes, I'm feeling a little bit in my bones as I get older. It's nothing actually to do with that. But the phrase, the bones are rattling, is actually something that the Holy Spirit just has been whispering to me again and again and again over the last couple of months as I get to the back end of this really tough season that I've come through. And it was almost like a word of encouragement. It was almost like he was saying, son, don't give up. Push through. Persevere. It might just be bones right now, but can you hear the rattle? Can you hear the bones rattling? Something is happening. And that's what I really want us to explore today. Something is around the corner. Stay close to me. Trust me. Continue to believe in me and my promises. And we're going to see the rest of that during the course of this morning. And the reality is, it was encouragement that I needed to hear. Because it gave me some hope. It gave me that light that I needed to be able to see in amongst the dark places that I had gone. And like the image that's painted in the vision that is in Ezekiel 37 that we'll see in a minute... I felt as though I'd been walking through this, um, this valley of dry bones. I was severely dehydrated. I was finding it so tough just to make it to the end of the day. But then I had to do it again the next day. I had to do it again the next day. I had to do it again the next day. 
So our text this morning comes from Ezekiel 37. It's a really big chunk of text. What I want to do is I want to read it in its entirety. There's 14 verses, so I apologize for that. But then we're actually going to take away what I hope are some things that will help you today, next week, and then we'll see what happens um, as uh, beyond that when it comes to this passage from Ezekiel 37. But I do believe that God wants to talk to us through these 14 verses today. All right, let's begin in verse 1. The Lord took hold of me, and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. Then he asked me, Son of man, can these bones become living people again? O sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am going to put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Verse 7, so I spoke this message just as he told me. Suddenly as I spoke, there was a rattling noise all across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. Then as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones. Then skin formed to cover their bodies, but they still had no breath in them. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to the wind, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath, from the four winds, breathe into these dead bodies so they may live again. So I spoke the message as he commanded me and breath came into their bodies. They all came to life and stood up on their feet, a great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying, we have become old, dry bones. All hope is gone. Our nation is finished. Therefore, prophesy to them and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. O my people, I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I will bring you back to the land of Israel. When this happens, O my people, you will know that I am the Lord. I will put my spirit in you and you will live again and return home to your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done what I said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. What a fantastic passage of scripture. There is so much in there, which is why I didn't want to cram it all into today. I've got a feeling the next couple of weeks we're going to continue to take out some of the treasure that is in this passage because there is so very much there. What I love about it is I love the vivid imagery that is painted. And a lot of people will just talk about this passage of Scripture as the Valley of Dry Bones. That's how they talk about it. Oh, you know about the Valley of Dry Bones that's in your Bible. They might not be able to reference as Ezekiel 37, but that's how they're talking about it. And it's certainly one of the most beloved visions that Ezekiel received. And as I said, we're not going to have time to go through all of it today. We will unpack it. But um, I want us to understand some context if we can, because it's great to read this, but for us to actually get a full sense of what's going on, we need to actually understand how do we get to this point? How do we get up to the point where God is giving Ezekiel this vision of this valley of dry bones and so to do that we need to go back to this period in Israel's history that's known as the Babylonian exile all right and so it's a period of time where essentially the Israelites were deported from Jerusalem by the Judean king so there was an exile that took place and amongst the first of those deported was a young man by the name of Ezekiel now, at this point of time, he wasn't a prophet. He was just a young man. Okay? So, that's where we're at. Ten years later, the king at the time, not content with just essentially sending a lot of Israelites into exile, he decides that 
he needs to do something more. So the king and his men destroy the only temple. They destroy the city and they send a second wave of Israelites into exile. Okay, so it's not a good, I think we can agree, it's not a good time for the Israelites at this point in time. The king is not their friend. He's not being kind to them. And for these deportees who lived in Babylon, the future just seemed so bleak. The future was uncertain. They didn't know uh, what was to come, but also they felt like they were falling into this kind of black hole. I don't know if you know your biblical history, but there's a, a thing called the Lost Tribes of Israel, where tribes just disappeared, and no one really knows what happens to them. And these Israelites that have been exiled now from Babylon know the stories of the Lost Tribes of Israel, and now they're starting to think, are we going to become another Lost Tribe? Are we going to disappear? So that's sort of what's happening, but there's something deeper on a deeper level that's actually taking place here. Um, and that is the fact that the Israelites are in a faith crisis. They're in a faith crisis. So they've got physical suffering, they've been exiled, but there's a crisis of faith that has resulted from that. Because the key symbols of their faith have all disappeared. The city of Jerusalem, their temple, their people, and the Davidic monarchy from King David, all gone. So everything that they knew in terms of their faith has simply disappeared before them, been destroyed. And according to some research that I did, many of those who were exiled would have come to a conclusion that said, our God is not as strong as the God of Babylon. This is their faith crisis. And it's a faith crisis that you and I go through in 2021. We're in a spiritual battle, as I mentioned. But if God is good, why do we go through bad stuff? If God is who he says he is, then why doesn't he, just with a spoken word, rescue us from the circumstances and the places that we are? We're actually probably no different at all to what the Israelites are feeling at this point of time. And you can see this, uh, uh, and I won't for the sake of time do it, go to Psalm 42, go to Psalm 115. You'll see some, um, some I'll say it's complaining, but, or maybe it's external processing, where they're saying, God, why have you abandoned us? Why have you forsaken us? Why can their God do this, but you can't keep us safe? Why are we exiled? There's a whole lot of things there. Ultimately, here's what the exiled Israelites wondered. Is God truly who he says he is, and is he faithful to his word? That's the place that they found themselves. And when we're confronted with that big wall, where we're confronted with trials and tribulations, we can ask that same question. And can I say this morning, I think it's okay to ask that question. I think it's okay to ask what God's doing. But don't stay there and don't stop there. Because neither of those two things are good for you. The faith of the Israelites told them one thing, but their circumstances were telling them something completely different. Their faith told them that God is in control, that God is good, that God was for them, that God would protect them. Their circumstances told them God has abandoned us, God isn't protecting us, and we've lost all hope for whatever is next. You see there's a, dis a discord there between faith and thought. They had this battle of the mind, and that's why in week one of this series, I told you about the importance of making sure your mind is aligned with the truth of God's word. And really, if, you, if we skip forward to verse 11, I know it's not necessarily the place to start, we should start at verse 1, but if we skip forward to verse 11, we actually get a very clear sense of where the Israelites are at. Look at what they're saying. We have become old, dry bones 
All hope is gone. Our nation is finished. That is not a people that are excited about the place they're at and what is next. And I know how they are feeling because I've had many moments over the last 12 months where I'd lost hope, where I thought not that I was finished, but in a sense I was finished, if that makes sense to you. I'd gone from being full of faith and having certainty in the plans and purposes of God for me, for my family, for our church, and the role that I was to play in that, to someone who was pessimistic about what was next, someone who couldn't kind of see any reason to keep going ahead. I lost hope for what was ahead, and my goal much like the Israelites in this passage, was simply just to get through one day at a time. And that's okay if you're going through some tough stuff. It's okay just to get through one day at a time. Because to get to tomorrow, you've got to get through today. But just don't stop. Don't stop and think, oh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna worry about tomorrow. You've got to push through. You've got to get through tomorrow. Because as we're about to see, we don't have to stay in that hopeless place. We don't have to stay where we're in that thing, you know, that place where things don't look good, where we've lost hope. We don't have to stay there. Because they might not look good at a moment of time. And you might not have any hope left in your situation. You might feel like everything that you've worked for and believed for is finished. But it's not. It's not because God's got more for you. Much more than you can think, believe or imagine. It simply means God hasn't finished turning it into that good and beautiful thing. He hasn't finished baking the cake. It's still in the oven. Our oven at home, the seal's not fantastic. And so if something says like to cook it for 40 minutes, if you cook it for 40 minutes, it's not cooked all the way through. And so after 40 minutes, I'll open the oven and I'm like, that's not finished cooking. So I've got to put it back in for another five or 10 minutes. Maybe that's what God's doing with you. Maybe you think, oh no, I only need to be there for 40 minutes, 40 days, whatever it might be. But God's going, yeah, close, but not quite done. Still got a little bit more cooking that needs to happen. And so you stay longer than you thought you would. And I don't know about you, but I find that really frustrating. I'm like, if something's supposed to take two days, I want it to take two days. I don't want it to take three days or five days. But I've had to learn to allow God to do what he needs to do in his time frame, not mine. Because in my time frame, it will all be like super speed. Be like, get it done, get it done, get it done. But that's not how God works. So what I want to do for the rest of our time together is I want to start breaking down uh, the first few verses of this passage from Ezekiel 47. So in verse 1, here's what we read. The Lord took hold of me. The Lord took hold of me and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. Now, as I mentioned before, when you're going through a tough season, it's so easy to feel like God has abandoned you, that he has left you behind, that he has walked away, that he doesn't care about you or what you're going through. And that's obviously how the Israelites felt. Because they were like all doom and gloom. Oh, our future is gone. There's no hope, etc., etc. But God wants to reassure them that that is not their truth. And so he starts this vision to Ezekiel. He starts by saying, the Lord took hold of me. 
Now, last week, I think it was, we talked from Philippians 4, and we read a passage in verse 5, and it's ended with, the Lord is near. And I used it to illustrate the fact that wherever we are, God is with us. He is close by. He is always there on the journey. And I think this, too, is what God wants to say to the Israelites. Because if you look at a couple of other translations... New International Virgin Version says, The hand of the Lord was on me. Physically, God's hand is upon them. So they can feel his presence. In the Good News Translation, I felt the powerful presence of the Lord. They are all saying the same thing to the Israelites. My children, I haven't left. I'm here. I am here with you. I have not abandoned you. And I think that's so very important for what is to come next. Because if they feel like God has left them, that he's not with them throughout the journey, then they won't be able to grab hold of everything that comes after this point of time. So he got it, he, God's telling them from the outset, you have to know despite what you're going through, that I am here with you. And the same is true for you and for me. We have to know, no matter how dark the night, that God is still there. We might not be able to see him, but he's still there. I put it this way in my notes. Whether we stand on the dais as a gold medalist, or we go out in the first heat of our event, event God is always with us. Do you believe that this morning, church? I hope you do. Deuteronomy 31.6. You probably all know this verse. It's very well known. But I think it's a great reminder and a great encouragement to each and every one of us. Here's what it says. Be strong. Don't give up. Be fearless. Don't look to your circumstances. Look to God. Don't be afraid and don't be scared by your enemies because the Lord your God is the one who marches with you. He won't let you down and he won't abandon you. He won't let you down. He won't abandon you. So my challenge for you this morning, church, is to be strong, to be fearless when you come up against trials and challenges, when you feel like you're trud trudging through the swamp, when you feel like you just want to give up and you want to walk away, be strong and be fearless. Not because of what you can do, but because of what God wants to do. Be strong, be fearless. And we read in that passage that it's actually the Spirit of God that carries away um, Ezekiel. And I just love the fact that um, the same spirit that carries away Ezekiel lives in you and me. It's the same spirit of God. I was carried away by the spirit of the Lord. I was talking to someone during the week on my pastoral calls. And they said this and it really stuck with me. They said, I may have left Jesus for a time, but he never left me. Isn't that a great truth? That sometimes we can be distant from him, but he's always close to us no matter where we are. So in verse 2, as we move forward to verse 2, we start to get this vivid sense of the desolation that faces Ezekiel. It says... Uh, that the bones covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere. So I thought about how do, we, how do we speak about this? And if you go back actually to Ezekiel 3, the same word here uh, that talks about the valley floor is rendered in Ezekiel 3 as plain, P-L-A-I-N. So like a desert plain, like the Simpson Desert or like the plains of Africa. If you've ever had a chance to see some videos, some photos, or stand there, you know that when you look out, what are you seeing? You're seeing a vast amount of nothing. And it goes on for miles and miles and miles and miles. 
That's what Ezekiel is faced with here. It's a vast sense of nothingness. And for me, because I've got young kids at home, I often think about The Lion King. Anyone seen Disney's The Lion King film? Well, there's a scene in there where they go to the elephant graveyard. And that's what it looks like. It's just a graveyard of nothingness. And as I was preparing and, and do, reading and doing some study, that's what I thought Ezekiel is facing. Just a barren nothingness of dead bones. It literally was Death Valley. The floor of the valley was so dense with human bones that the Bible tells us they were everywhere. They were everywhere. Ezekiel saw them all around. He couldn't notice anything else in this valley. It's all he could see. And you know sometimes when you're in a tough season, all you see is the negative. All you see uh, is the death. All you see is the, the lack of life. That's what Ezekiel was faced with. I don't know if you've experienced that. If you've ever sort of looked around and metaphorically speaking, you've just seen dead bones everywhere. I know that I've done that and it's a really tough place to be. To see beyond the bones and the death that's all around. But I've said through this series so far, staying positive is a choice. It's a choice that we have to make. So sometimes we need to realign what we're looking at. Let's not look at the death because in every place, no matter how dark it is, you can always find life. And we'll talk more about that next week. We need to stay positive in this kind of environment. Now the end of verse 2 tells us the bones were completely dried out. And I think this is important because we've got to get a sense of how, this will sound funny, how dead the bones actually are. All right, now, the truth is, outside of a body, bones have no purpose. Their purpose is inside a living body. That's when bones actually have a purpose, a living, breathing body. Outside of that, when life has passed, there is no purpose for bones. Okay, that's the way that God has designed us. That's the way that God has designed um, you know, um, animals and that kind of thing. So Ezekiel is confronted with this in this valley. These bones aren't just dead bones. These bones are dry bones. They're dry bones, meaning they have been there for a long, long time. Any life that was in the bones in terms of marrow and all that kind of stuff, I'm not a doctor, I don't know what else is in there. I'm thankful for God's design because it works. But anything that was there is what disappeared a long time ago. These are dry, dry bones. And that's very, very important for you to make a mental note on right now. Because it gives us context for what is to come. When something's been dead for a long time, we generally speaking give up hope that life will come back to that dead thing. I thought about it. If someone's marriage, for example, has been dead for a long time, if the couple are just going through the motions, if they're staying together for the sake of the kids, there's no expectation that life will return to that marriage because it's been dead for a long, long time. What tends to happen is either they stay married until they pass away, one of them passes away, or you hear it regularly, mar people divorce once the kids have grown up and they're no longer at home. That's because the marriage died a long, long time ago. The danger for you and for me when we're surrounded by dead bones, when we're surrounded by bad memories, when we're surrounded by negative people, by dark thoughts, whatever is dead is around us. The danger is that we get to a place where we don't think life can come back into that. Where we accept that this thing is dead and that becomes like our default. 
That becomes what we accept. But when we do that, do you know what? We rob ourselves of the hope that we have in Jesus. No marriage, for example, when God breathes on it, no marriage is too dead to be revived. And I've heard some fantastic testimonies of people that just hated each other. We're living separate lives. But guess what? The breath of God came in, restored them individually and as a couple. It's just amazing. Anyway, that's not what my message is about. If we're not careful, we can allow the dry bones that are completely dried out to impact us so much that we forget the promises of God. There's more than 8,000 promises in our Bible for you and for me. But the deadness can shrink our faith to the point where we we don't even believe one of those 8,000 promises if we allow it. I'll say it again, staying positive is a choice. We need to always choose to stay positive, even when we don't feel like it. Because I think we would agree there's times that we don't want to be positive. We don't feel like being positive. But that comes to the battle of the mind and the choice that we make. And so in verse 3, we start to see this interaction between Ezekiel and God. I love this verse. Here's what he says, because God acknowledges the dangerous place that we can find ourselves. Because he asks, son of man, can these bones become living people again? Remember how these were dead, dead bones? They were dry bones. They'd been dead for so long that any speck of life had dried out of them. And as I read this, I kind of felt like it was a trick question. I don't know if you see it that way, but I felt like it's a trick question. Because I think God's actually inquiring of Ezekiel about where his faith is at that moment of time. So that he knows how to proceed for everything that is next. It's like a challenge. It's like a test of faith. Perhaps God is trying to see see what Ezekiel can believe before he reveals what's to come. And he'll do the same in our lives too. I'm sure you've experienced it. I certainly have. Have you ever noticed right before a breakthrough, right before you get an answer to something that you've been praying into for a long, long time, have you ever noticed there's a test of faith that you've got to go through? And your breakthrough comes on the other side of that. I don't know why he does it, but that's how he works. I've experienced it numerous times in my life. And I think it's actually one of the key indicators that God is up to something. And so, I welcome that. It's also a little bit scary, but I know that it's exciting and it's scary, and so I do this kind of dance with God. I'm like, oh, that's so exciting. Oh, hold on, that's freaking me out a little bit. Oh, no, that's so exciting. Because I know that he's doing something. I know something is about to come. I look forward to those moments with excitement and dread in equal measures. Because the darkness of the night brings the light of the morning. And sometimes all we've got to do is get through the darkness of night so that we can get to the light of the morning. I think it's like God is saying to Ezekiel, do you think I can bring these dry, long dead bones back to life? Do you think I can do it? Do you think I can? Do you think I can? Is your level of faith at the point where despite these circumstances that are around you, despite what you can see, Despite how improbable it looks right now, can you believe that life will arise from this valley of death? 
Can you believe it? Can you believe it? Can you believe it? I remember, um, I've shared before, uh, my friend Chad died at 33 and um, you know, we journeyed with uh, my best friend and his wife and um, I remember when he died at the Mana Hospital and you know, his wife was in grief, of course, but for, I reckon, maybe the next week, she just prayed that God would bring him back to life. She continued to pray that God would perform a mighty miracle. And I guess like Chatty had just walked through the door, say, hey, Lauren, I'm back. Now, it didn't happen, but I love that level of faith where despite the fact that he had passed away, she still believed that God could. We need to be at that place too. He may not, he may not, because we don't know what his purpose is, but we have to believe that he could. And if we're just praying but not believing that it can happen, it's just empty words. We have to believe that whatever is dead in our life can come back to life. Now, I don't know why, but in the Heinsen household, we have trouble keeping goldfish alive. When Jackie and I were first dating, I worked at Coles and she at Katara. And she came to meet me after work one week. And she brought a little goldfish, one goldfish in a plastic bag. And it was a gift. So I took it home and I cared for it. You know, I got the tank sorted, did everything I could, fed it properly, loved it. And it died. Not straight away. Like it wasn't, you know, like the next day or that day that it just, you know, and the fish is gone. But it died and I was like, but I took such good care of it. Fast forward a number of years in our house and one of my daughters got some goldfish. I think it was three or four goldfish in their tank at home. And then three became two. And two became one. And you know when you're down to one, you're really praying for that one to make it, aren't you? But then, like, I think we'd been away maybe. We came back. Fish was wrong side up. And all the goldfish had done were gone. But do you know, as I had to clean out those goldfish and send them along to whatever's next for goldfish, I never crossed my mind once to pray that they would come back to life. It just didn't. But I, I was wondering this morning, should I? Could I have believed that the goldfish could turn right side up and start swimming again? I don't know. Why not? Absolutely. <laughs> so I say that because maybe today God's asking you if you can believe for new life to be breathed into something that's dead. Maybe it's not a goldfish. We bought some new goldfish yesterday, so that's an easy solution for that one. I'll keep you updated in terms of how they go over the next weeks and months. Three at the moment, three for three this morning, so we're going okay. So they've survived the first night. But for you, maybe it's a broken relationship and you think, no, that's dead beyond repair. Can you believe that God can breathe new life into that. Maybe it's a dream that you feel like it's died, it's passed you by. But maybe this morning the Holy Spirit's saying, I'm not done. The dream isn't over. Can you believe that I can bring it back to life? Maybe it's a lack of hope for the future that God has for you. My question this morning is, can you, no matter how unlikely, no matter how far gone something seems to be, no matter how dead it appears to be, can you believe that God can bring it back to life? Because in response to God's question, Ezekiel says this, O sovereign Lord, you alone know the answer to that. Can I just say, I don't think I would have responded in such a way 
that Ezekiel did. I think I would have very unwisely, mind you, said, yeah, I reckon you can, God. You know, and had this conversation that was based on simply what I thought. But Ezekiel is much wiser than I. That's why he's got a book in the Bible, and you'll see there's no book of Wayne in the Bible. That's one of the reasons why. But he knows his only hope is found in God. And so he doesn't try and figure it out. He doesn't try and make sense of what's going on. He simply says, God, I surrender to you and what you're doing. He had no hope in the bones that were around him, but he did have hope in God. He had a hope in God. He didn't presume to know what God was doing. He didn't presume to go, oh, God, I know what you're doing. You're just setting this up so that, you know, down the track something fantastic is going to happen. He didn't presume any of that. But he was confident that God knew what was happening. And that's the place that we need to be at when things don't make sense. We too need to get to that place and having a surrendered heart and a surrendered mind just like Ezekiel did. Ezekiel had to choose to believe that God was bringing about good in this situation right there and then. Now we've got the benefit that we can read past what's happening but at that moment of time... Ezekiel had to make a choice to stay positive, even though nothing around him pointed to that. There was nothing that he could hold on to, a sliver of positivity in amongst everything that was around him and everything that he saw. And hopefully for you, hopefully for me as we finish this morning, we know a bit about the character of God. But we can't presume to know what he's doing and how he's doing it. All we can have hope in and believe in that God is doing something and at the end of that, it's going to be good and it's going to be beautiful. Don't try and figure out how God's going to bring that about because all you're going to do is waste your mind and your thoughts. We simply have to be like Ezekiel and trust that God is doing something and we will get to see that at some point of time. Because remember, if it's not good yet, it just means God isn't done yet. He's still working. And so I want to leave this morning on a cliffhanger from verse 4. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord." Because as we'll see next week, something is happening to these dry, super dead bones. They're about to rattle. 